Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's uh, Signpost webinar on this bright, sunny day. Uh, the Signpost webinar is brought to you by Chagask in association with National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, I'm joined this morning to help with questions by Catherine. Good morning, Catherine. Hello, Pat. How are you? Hopefully this is not a one-day summer, uh, 24 <laughs> degrees uh, uh, forecast. We haven't seen we'll that. We'll enjoy it when we have it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Also joined, if you, if you want to turn on your, your camera and, and uh, unmute Eamon by Eamon Meskel. Eamon is regional manager with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and he is also involved with managing the, the white-tailed eagle. Eamon, you're, you're very welcome, as is your, your companion there sitting on your shoulder. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Eamon, you might give us a, 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 an idea of the, the role you play in and, and the, the roles you take on in, in the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Okay, well, I'd be regional manager with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and my office is in Nina, County Tipperary. So I'd be managing a region from Waterford up to Tipperary, Limerick and East Cork. Um, so we have, uh, we have many irons in the fire. I mean, we're, we're involved in education, in project management for conservation projects, uh, enforcement. Uh, we're also in an advisory capacity and um, we have a heavy input into the planning regulations as well, uh, particularly with um, regard to uh, planning applications within Natura 2000 sites. And um, also indeed for um, farm management plans and all that as well within sites of nature conservation value. And uh, well, I suppose one of the, uh, we've a lot of areas within biodiversity where we don't have great news, but one of the good news areas is the whole area around birds of prey. And, and, and it's in that area that you're, you're, you're talking to us today. It is, yeah. I'm um, project managing the uh, white-tailed eagle reintroduction uh, release back into Ireland. And um, we've seen an awful lot of, of um, birds of prey in the countryside over the last uh, number of years. And it's very good to see them. I mean, they're, they're at the top of our food chain. They're an indicator that the environment is green and we're doing something right. Um, so it's very good to have the buzzards coming back and the increase in kestrel populations and peregrine falcon populations, sparrowhawks, and now we have the white-tailed eagle as well. Okay, well, well without further ado, I know you, you have a fascinating uh, uh, presentation for us, so if you want to share your screen and, and, and fire ahead. Okay, well I suppose the first thing you have to, that's a, a mature white-tailed sea eagle with a fully white tail, and um, that's a photograph that we commissioned a, um, a photographer to go out to Scotland at the start of the whole project to take a photograph so that we could use in presentations like this. And sitting on my shoulder would be the, um, the offspring of some of that progeny of white-tailed eagles. That the photograph at, the, at my back was taken of uh, three white-tailed sea eagle chicks, which is very rare to get three uh, white-tailed eagle chicks in a nest. Normally you have one, sometimes two, but we had three up in Loch Derg. So one of the lads who was up in the top of that tree, 80 foot high in a pine tree, took that photograph. So I said, I put it at my back and I winced the odd time to see that that beak isn't alive because they have quite a strong beak and quite strong talons, as you can see from that photograph. So look, we'll, we'll kick on and I have a number of slides and I'll go on through them pretty quickly, but I'll just get into the detail of the, uh, the project as we go through the slideshow as well. <clears throat> so really reintroduction of the, uh, it's a key conservation tool. And uh, we had a situation where our white-tailed eagles um, in the country, um, we had them in several sites along the sea coast, and um, they disappeared over the course of time. And uh, in 2000 and or 1909, in uh, up there near Bangaleras in North Donegal, was the last documented um, um, nesting place, successful nesting place of a white-tailed sea eagle. Um, so, look, I suppose the white-tailed sea eagle. It had been kind of declined to extinction. So we had it in our skies, we had it in our environment. We, it was a commonplace, um, it fitted into the niche 
its own particular niche in the countryside and through egg collection and through persecution, as you can see there, and um, other factors as well, they did, you know, the environment at the time, well, then the bird actually declined to extinction. So the, the secret was to uh, bring it back and to see if we could get it back into the countryside. So you can see there the years, uh, 1880 in, in um, Donegal, um, all the way down to 1894 in the Beira Peninsula and then in uh, Portaclay up there in Mayo was the last time. So uh, just to show you a little bit about the distribution of the white-tailed eagle, well, you can see there that it's in, um, it's in Eastern Europe, um, all the way through Siberia, up around Norway and uh, Iceland. And um, that is the kind of a distribution map. Um, but recently there in Scotland um, in 1975, the reintroduction project in the Isle of Rum. So that's been very successful. And it's a model that we kind of followed, but not 100% followed because we had our own um, input, our, our ideas to put into place as well. So the white-tailed sea eagle, how did it come about? It came about in um, uh, 2007. We, uh, we introduced the white-tailed eagle chicks from uh, Norway over a five-year period. And 2012, the first breeding attempt was in the wild. 2014, 13, the first fledging, uh, which would be when an eagle flew off the nest in Loch Derg. And uh, 2019, the first fledging of Irish bred parents, which was stage four, I suppose, of the project, where you had Irish bred parents uh, bred in a nest in Ireland, and they reared their own young. So where did the birds come from? They came from Norway and uh, we built up a strong relationship with the Norwegian authorities, Nina, the uh, conservation uh, research group in Norway with their department of uh, directorate of nature as well. So we built up that uh, relationship and each uh, year for five or six years, we got 10 or 15 or 20, 20 wild uh, chicks from the, um, from the white-tailed eagle nests in Norway. So that's the way they came in. And at the end of the whole process of that uh, five, six year period, we had 100 white-tailed eagles in the country. So how we identified them by putting on different wing tags for each year. And um, just so that we could identify, identify them as we go forward into the future. So essentially that's the way a white-tailed eagle chick looked just before it was released into the wild. And um, it's got a satellite tag there in its back that we follow the telemetry of it. And it's also got the, the wing tags so that we can identify it from a distance with, uh, with uh, telescopes and binoculars and so that people can identify them as well. And um, so a week before we release them, we put on all that paraphernalia on them. It doesn't affect them one way or the other. And um, they get used to it over the last week in the release cage and then we open the gates and they fly out. So before we started the project, we had to comply with all these different regulations and we just didn't decide that we were going to bring in white-tailed sea eagles to be a great idea. We had to do the research, we had to do the uh, the process of, of where we got to actually bring them in and um, we had to do appropriate assessments under Act Article 6.3 of the EU Habitats Regulations 411 and um, we had to do a stage one assessment which uh, screened out any negative impacts that the white-tailed eagles would have on the immediate sites of their release and where we expected them to go. So we did that. So th obviously when we were able to screen them out after an in-depth study, well, then we didn't have to do a stage two screening under the habitat uh, regulations. So where did it come from? Long before that, it was part of uh, an Irish agreement in 1992. Um, at the uh, Article 8 and 9 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which we became part of, that we would commit to restoring an extinct species back into our environment and, and uh, see could we actually uh, proceed with that. So um, a group got together ourselves and the uh, Golden Eagle Trust and others, and we decided that, yeah, look, it was a possibility. We built up our, our relationships and Lo and behold, here in Norway, these are the lads who um, who went out and collected the white-tailed eagle chicks from the nest, and they they did all the biometrics. You can see there up in the top left-hand uh, uh, slide, and then they they put them into kennels uh, there in the back of that trailer. And uh, we hired uh, paid a cargo flight from Trondheim Airport, and all the kennels with the white-tailed eagle chicks were put in it and arrived in Farnham Four. So that was all the uh, so the young eagles. Just a little bit about the eagles. They spend five years before they're actually mature. 
Um, so it's a long drawn out process and this is a critical period. We could lose a lot and we did lose a lot in that five year period. Uh, the young uh, eagles face a life or death struggle during the first winter is very critical. And if they make it through that, well then the likelihood is, despite avian influenza or other factors, that they could live to between 20 and 30 years. The uh, female normally lays one to two eggs in March and the incubation takes six weeks and the young leave the nest 10 to 12 leaks, and they're capable of taking care of themselves approximately 30 days after leaving the nest, but they will continue to beg for food for months. So all that, we had to build out all of that information into our uh, bank, memory bank, when we were thinking about uh, uh, reintroduction and all that has actually taken place. So we got the white-tailed eagles in, and I'll show you a clip of where they're kept and uh, the type of release cages, four meter squared release cages, as we go through the show, but the white-tailed eagle dispersal and uh, monitoring, we just don't get them in. We get them in, uh, we keep them in release cages for five weeks, and when they have their uh, flight feathers, well, then uh, we open the release cages and let them out and give them some supplementary feeding afterwards, and they're the, uh, uh, one of the white-tailed eagle chicks flying from the nest. So we research and monitor them after. We follow them around with the, with the uh, tags, the satellite tags so we know where they are and what they're doing most of them uh, sometimes we lose uh, the tags depending on light and and, uh, and satellite uh, proficiency and all that kind of stuff but this generally is the type of habitat that they're in these are the nests that they have been taken off the nest is nearly as big as a mini minor car and they they add to them every year and uh, the lads climb up there and take the uh, the nest now it's a critical time when we're taking the the white tailed eagle chicks off the nest because there's certain criteria. Uh, the Norwegians don't take uh, any more than uh, one eagle from a nest at a time, and only a nest that has two chicks. Um, so there's one left in the chick afterwards, and um, all that. And then, there's, you know, some of them are accessible easily, some of them are inaccessible, like this one. And where are they? This one in Norway is just below the village there. You can see the nest site in the middle, and there was two chicks in that nest. They also nest on places like this, on the sea coast, where they, they're opportunistic, if you like, up on those telemetry stations. So phase one was we got them in 2006 to 2011. So in 2012, then we had one active nest and um, we had um, one pair, you know, but none, none fledged in 2012. So in 2013, we had our first fledging up in Loch Derg at Mount Shannon, where we had two fledged. And um, all the way along, then it started to increase. And then in 2019, we had one, um, uh, just one fledging and 2018 with four. And I'll explain the reasons for this afterwards. So that was it. So this was our, our population white-tailed sea eagle growth between 2007 and 2019. And you can see the lines there. I mean, it kind of flat lines above um, after 2017. And I, that's a kind of a, a semi-accurate reflection. I'd say the true line would be between the yellow line and the orange line where we possibly had something like 40 chicks or 40 white-tailed eagles in the country. And this would have been a mixture of released birds and um, white-tailed eagles that were bred in the wild, um, naturally. So uh, at 2019, we realized, look, we were getting somewhere in the region of seven uh, to eight uh, breeding pairs every year. Um, they were being successful and unsuccessful, so it needed a kick, and I'll talk about that in a minute. That's why phase two reintroduction came into being for the last two years. So really, we lost a number of white-tailed eagles through, you can see poisoning there is a big one, um, shooting. We had a number shot, turbine strikes, power line collisions, intra-conflict would be where white-tailed eagles actually kill each other during the mating season, starvation, avian flu is coming into play, and then unknowns. So um, you can see there in, in 2012, we lost uh, a good five birds, five white-tailed eagles and, and all that. So it is, I mean, we go out and we collect the birds and we send them into the RVL, the, the Regional Veterinary Laboratory, and we try and find out how and why they died. So we x-ray, the first thing we do is we, we x-ray them. You can see there where there's one shot, there's about seven pellets in that um, white-tailed eagle, but you know something, I don't think that's what killed the, that particular white-tailed eagle. I think it was other factors because they are a big bird and they can take a, 
quite an impact. And um, so there was no killing blow, there was no organ damage in that, but we do have shootings and, and we did have one situation in Tipperary where we had 50 uh, pellets in a, in a dead uh, white-tailed eagle, but we've only had two or three uh, that were shot and you saw the, the graphs there. So this is the kind of a spread of uh, poisonings in the early days where uh, those black spots and then shootings are the up there in Tipperary and um, uh, a little bit further north and unknown staying out in the Iberian Peninsula and uh, things like that. But the poisoning factor was really dealt with very well. We worked with the farming organizations, the IFA and uh, the local stakeholders. And eventually, I suppose what we've come around to now is that since 2015, we haven't had a poisoning of a white-tailed sea eagle. Um, so that's, that certainly is a, a, a positive state. We did have mortality factors in turbine strikes. And the turbine strike just chops the wing, chops the bird, kills a stone dead. And you'd imagine when you see a, a turbine that it, it doesn't have an impact. Well, it does here in Norway in Smola. They had, they had 40 deaths uh, because there was a wind turbine put up between a roosting station, which was an island, and a breeding area, which was 10 miles away. So the bird's flying between one or the other. Um, Intraspecific conflict. I mean, I've seen white-tailed eagles chasing each other and fighting each other. It's a messy business and uh, it's out there to the laws of the jungle. So they do kill and they do kill uh, fairly comprehensively when they want to. Um, we've always, always had the kind of belief or misbelief that white-tailed eagles or people's uh, conception would be they would be a danger to lambs. And this was a big, um, big topic at the early stage, uh, stages with the farming communities and the, the sheep uh, organizations that we were, it was going to have an impact. We did our research and we found that there wouldn't be an impact and especially the Scottish Natural Heritage Commission the report and the findings of that was that there was no um, live lambs uh, proven to be taken, that five dead lambs were found all right in areas but they were scavenged by white-tailed sea eagles. What people don't realise is that a white-tailed sea eagle could sit on a tree or in a field for two days and not move. And once it has something to feed on, well, then it'll feed and then it'll go back there again. They're not this bird that goes off into the sky and you see them miles high, even though you do see them at times. Um, but generally, they're quite docile. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what they do. And, and generally, if they find a carcass or something like that, they're happy to stay around that carcass for a week or two or three weeks, as long as it lasts, and then they'll fly off and find something else. But they also feed on fish as well. <clears throat> so... There are economic and social benefits to reintroducing eagles. It, I mean, it's worth five million pounds to the Isle of Mull um, each year from tourism coming in. And here, here's a picture of the um, white, uh, the Mount Shannon uh, nest, which was the first nest site. And that island off in the distance was the, the, the eagles were very uh, uh, useful to us because they made the nest where you could see it. So for 10,000 people showed up. Um, in Mount Shannon uh, to see the uh, uh, white-tailed eagle nest in July of 2014. And um, so that's the kind of interest that it had. That's what's standing at the door is the uh, Norwegian ambassador. And they take a, a heavy interest in everything that goes on in their country and they, they visit us quite regularly. So the local, it's very important that we get local community participation. And uh, certainly the people in Mount Shannon came on big time. They, they had um, Alan Mio, our project manager at the time, worked very well with the Mount Shannon people. And uh, they came up with some great initiatives and, and help. And, and um, it gave a certain amount of employment as well. The two or three of the lads were in that uh, caboose there, uh, more or less full time during the summer with telescopes and everything like that. So it was good. We have key figures in the project, not alone Ellen, but uh, Frank McMahon there on the right, who's, who uh, died of cancer a couple of years ago. He's a fantastic guy. He worked with us in the National Parks and Wildlife Service. He, Went out to Norway and built up great relations. Philip Buckley and of course with Claire Herdman and lots of other Damien Clark up in Wexford. So, so here's a picture of the first brood of white-tailed sea eagle chicks that were hatched by white-tailed sea eagle parents born in Ireland. And uh, this was up in the top of that tree, 80 foot high. And the process is that one of our lads will go up and, and uh, up and shibby up the tree in a rope, a very dangerous occupation. And he'll go to the top of the tree with bags and put each one of the chicks into a bag, lower them to the floor. And then we do all the biometrics and tag them and put them back up on the, the nest. But this is just um, Damien Clark went up and, and, and did this one and he got a big surprise when he looked in over the side of the nest when he saw these three chicks 
And there's a 10 second clip here of how shocked they were as well. So it's very rare that you actually get that uh, happening because um, in, in, in Norway, even the percentage is so low that you get two chicks or one chick to an edge. So it just shows you how um, friendly and, and acceptable and, and good the habitats that we have are for the white-tailed eagles um, in, in Loch Derg particular. So courtship happens around January and February, and then the chicks are born around um, St. Patrick's Day and um that they're the ones in our wild and and what we do is we get our our the wild, wild uh, uh e eagle chicks from norway they come in from Trondheim, and uh, we have volunteers there that carry the eagles in and you've got to be very careful and know what they're doing because those talons can stick into you but almost immediately on arrival into farnpore airport we have them in our release cages within a couple of hours and they feed more or less that evening so it's very successful um getting at those uh, nests can be very difficult and the timing is crucial if you're if you're there too early in other words if the eagle chicks are too young well then you can't take them to put the uh, uh, tags on them and, and to put the satellite tags because the, the downy feathers, uh, they're too young and it'll, it'll hurt the skin. So if you're too late, of course, they do what they call branching. They walk out on the branches of the trees and you can't get at them. So uh, you have to time it down to the day, actually. And your criteria for selection, then, you know, you have to go up and, and uh, take and uh, you can only take a chick off of a nest that has two or more uh, birds in it. So the biometrics is very important. We get, we were able to sex them and age them and and uh, take their weight and, and where they're from and, and a little DNA sample and all that. So that's very important as well. So this is the first uh, white-tailed eagle chick nest. The, the story of Eagle Bee is, is very good. Bernardine, we called it actually. And um, this was two years ago in Loch Derg. And uh, one of the most aggressive uh, white-tailed eagle chicks that we've ever come across she just, she, she was the boss and she led, we, when we're feeding them for the five weeks in the cages, they don't see us, but we watch them through little keyholes and uh, boy, was she strong. So we let them out anyway. And uh, this is their first flight or her first flight off onto the shores of Loch Derg. Within two days, you can see the line of telemetry there that, that gave us the line of where she actually uh, flew to. And then she came back to Loch Derg. Two months later, B was up in, in Scotland. <laughs> she flew up and stayed up in County Antrim for about three or four days and then flew over to Scotland, stayed there for six months and then came back down, returned back to Ireland. And, and now she's hooked up with a male who lost its mate in Mount Shannon. Uh, too young to breed, but maybe next year would be her first attempt. They built a nest this year. So that's the story. And that's what happened to a couple of this bird, um, uh, this white-tailed eagle chick in, in Argyle, who's breeding for the last five years up there, uh, was an eagle. Uh, chick that we uh, brought over from Norway and, and reared and, and she flew off and, and, who, and, and uh, made a mate in Scotland. But um, we're hoping that some of them will come back with, with the eagle chicks from, from Scotland. So this is kind of dispersal. Um, the range is very important of white-tailed uh, sea eagles when we let them out. I mean, the, the practice is when we let them out, they travel the country. And they get to know the sites, they get to know the other places where sea eagles are, and then they settle there. You see the slide there on the right hand side. That's where they settle down eventually um, in their own kind of a place uh, where they have a range of maybe 1.3 or 2 kilometers that they stick with most of the time. So, so they, do, um, they do fly, they do fly far. And um, so they do come back anyway. So the milestones today, the first pair bred in 2012, the first pair fledged in 2013, and the first Irish bred uh, recruited to the breeding population of the wild was in 2020. So it's a long process. It doesn't happen today or tomorrow. Um, eight to 10 pairs are now breeding annually um, with 34 young fledged to date. And uh, you can see there in 2019, in the yellow line, uh, we had one fledgling. Um, a lot of that was due to the, in 2018 as well, we had three, is it three, four? Um, but a lot of that was, even though we had eight or nine uh, with nests, the storms came at the wrong time. And in one particular instance, just when the eggs were laid, we found one of the white-tailed eagle females uh, dead in the nest. And when we tested it, it was avian influenza. So a couple of things like that are critical. Um, and that's why we needed a phase two introduction, because it was just getting a little bit static. 
So already the introduction is working because we've we've that one up in, in Mount Shannon and we have two up in one of the lakes in the Midlands as well, farming a, ter ter a territorial pair. So um, are, are some regions more successful than others? Yes, um, we have, I mean, we have 74 uh, nesting attempts um, with 12 of them in uh, Loch Derg. But even though it's only 12 out of 74, we have nearly more than half of the um, success rate in Loch Derg than we have in all of the other uh, nest sites. So the inland uh, waterways seem to be far more suitable, even though we have a fantastic coastline and they will uh, reap benefits and fruit in the future. Um, so that's kind of it's, that's the, the battle. It's 54 nesting attempts in a freshwater as composed to compared to 24 marine sites. So we are an ideal uh, country for them. Uh, for the whitetail legal and we have we have both inland waterways, uh, rivers and, and 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 sea and I suppose the 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 whitetail eagles they feed on the sea dead seals and all this kind of thing but they also feed on shallow swimming fish like mackerel and herring and in inland then we get the eagles feeding on on pike and uh, after the spawning season for salmon we'll say in winter time. 100% of those salmon die or 98%, they'll feed on the carcasses of the, the salmon that spawn and the same with lamprey in the summertime. So there's an all round, uh, all year round uh, availability of, of food. Um, so these, this is kind of where we recovered the dead birds. Uh, that's the benefit of having the um, satellite tags on them. We're able to see where they stop and where there's no response from. And we get a flat line out of it and we go out and in 98% of cases, we're able to pick up the, uh, the board and take it away and get it analysed. So you can see there down the Iver Peninsula in Kerry, because that's where we released them first. Killarney National Park was our first um, release site. So there's a, a good few, but they have spread all over the country there. So it's unfortunate to, to find a dead bird like that, but that's what we have. So listen, we're into the phase two reintroduction phase. Um, 2019 to 2022, uh, 23, um, National Parks and Wildlife Service are the lead um, uh, managers of the project now, which is most unusual for a, a department. Um, but we do have the expertise and we have the knowledge now and we have the resources and the staff that are interested to do it. So we did, we built up our, our relationships with the Norwegians again. So we've added uh, 50, the plan is, and we have 25 of them in already, 50 white legal chicks. We got a uh, model done by Fielding in 2019 that examined the, uh, the success of the first uh, phase one introduction. And he said, look, even though it's surviving managing, you need to bring in a cohort of, of vegan chicks now. And this was, this was mirrored from the Norwegian experience. Um, so that's what we're at now. So we had 10 birds released in, in two sites in 2020. We had 21 uh, eagles released last year in four sites. We expanded our range into County Waterford. So we have uh, Tipperary, uh, Limerick, Kerry and Waterford are now the four recognised release sites. And that's kind of that red line is the general trend of where, you know, the birds go north. Uh, Sometimes most of them don't leave Ireland, some of them do, um, and some that leave Ireland come back. So it'll be interesting to see how it develops. So that's just uh, another slide of a lad taking a, uh, a chick off the nest. And what they do is they just pop a coat or a box over it and then put it into a sack and, and lower it to the ground. These are the uh, release cages. They're about four metres in width. And um, just construct them. We, we make it from, from old... Uh, um, you know, the type of timber that will decompose over time. And uh, that's the inside. We feed them on that platform. You see a little white cir black circle at the back. So they don't see us when we're putting the fish in through that uh, black circle onto the, the platform. And then they come along the, uh, the um, and they hop up on, on, on the platform and feed. We feed them twice a day for the first four weeks in captivity and once a day then after that because the first four weeks they their feathers and their bones strengthen and they need more food and um so that's the that's the view they have from the inside of the release cage this is the waterford one <clears throat> and uh here's uh if you're quick you'll see the the eagle on the first day of release the first flight of one of our eagles down in waterford one second i need to click the button and um it's a it's a lovely flight, actually. It's 
So you'd imagine that they fly for miles when they get out. They don't. It's their first flight. They have to become aware of their surroundings and uh, become aware of their environment. And within three weeks, most of the eagle chicks go from their um, area that they, they release from. And, and we find that bird there. We found it over in Hukhead three days later on the telemetry and three weeks later it came back again stayed there for six months and and that's up in county antrim now i think so that's that's the way the fled this is kind of the team that was involved last year as well as others the first tail the <clears throat> you know they takes the eagles five years to mature and this is a chicken its first year and we have used wing tags but now we're starting to use leg tags they're a little less intrusive and they stay on the wing tags can fall off so they're, uh, they don't, and they're e easily identifiable as well. Uh, they're an absolutely amazing bird. This would be the area of, of um, Norway that we get, and each dot is a white-tailed eagle nest. So you can see the amount of white-tailed eagle uh, pairs that they have in Norway, and, and that's why. So we got the Norwegians over um, in the early stages to look to see was the territory suitable, and then they come over and back periodically just to see how the, uh, the white-tailed eagles are doing. So. So it's a nice relationship we've built up with the, a very uh, gro a good group of people. So the last slide is just the reason for success or failure. The number of release uh, population need for a critical mass. You do need a critical mass of eagles because they need to pair off and they need to um, you know, farm territories. And uh, if they haven't got the critical mass, well, then you're not going to get the, um, the uh, numbers to make up those pairs. Um, we do a post-release monitoring and recovery of birds, so that's very important. So we follow the, the tags and we go out as soon as we see that there's something wrong and we try to recover the bird. Not always possible, we failed in some occasions, but generally we pick up the dead, uh, dead, dead animal and, and we bring it and we get it tested out. And we've got to be very careful because with avian influenza, we don't know if it's you know, you're supposed to, you have to be very careful with that. And some of our eagles have died of avian influenza. Um, so you've got to be very careful with that, uh, that in mind. Um, we have legislation, follow up and enforcement of, of the Wildlife Act. We haven't had any uh, need to, uh, even though some of the birds were shot, I mean, they could be shot in Limerick or Tipperary and they might be found in Waterford. So we haven't met anybody who's carrying home a white-tailed eagle in their hunting bag. So um, there has really been no enforcement, but we get out there and we're, we're seen to be there where the uh, the bird is, is found dead. So people get to know we're around. Um, so we have uh, public sites. We have awareness in the community. We try and let people know what's going on. And uh, if the eagles are in their area, we get onto the communities and we tell them. And uh, just so that they're aware, because um, it's a fantastic thing to know. And then they build up a relationship with us, people build up in communities, and we have a biodiversity site as well that they can report. The National Parks and Wildlife Service.ie website has a, a link to white legals and people can report sightings and all this. So it's critical. This was really important in the early stages to address the perceptions and misconceptions regarding the threat of livestock and impact on already existing fauna. We did all the um, uh, assessments and reports that we had to do. And um, we, we worked with the stakeholders and, and the, the relevant parties. And, and we, we proved that, look, the white-tailed eagle wasn't a cause of, of concern from taking live lambs and stuff like that. It will take uh, placenta and uh, all the, maybe a dead, dead lamb or something like that. But on the whole, and we haven't had any um, positive identification yet of uh, an eagle taking a, a lamb. It's generally the fish and everything like that. So listen, that's basically uh, the talk, uh, Pat. And um, I think we're at the, the last slide again, which is a lovely slide. So um, um, that was taken in mull actually. So I hope you enjoyed the show. And if there's any questions, you're more than welcome. I'll try and answer them. Yeah, the questions are starting to come in and I uh, invite you to, to submit your questions to the questions and answers. And an absolutely fascinating insight uh, and I suppose one of the, the uh, you might stop sharing there and we'll, we'll go back onto full screen. Yeah. Uh, one of the, 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 the questions that, that you would have is you saw the, the kind of the initial successes of numbers, I'd say probably disappointment with what happened in, in kind of 2018, 2019 on, on your part. It kind of strikes me that it's going to take ongoing management uh, of the, the project to try and, and make sure it's, a, it's an overall success. 
Absolutely, Pat. It takes uh, managing from day one, <clears throat> from the time the um, the chicks uh, come into the country to the release cage stage, to fixing the, um, the satellite tags, to when they're released, and we do some supplementary feeding for uh, three or four or five weeks uh, when the uh, when the eagles are out in the wild, and then they're left to their own devices. But we constantly follow them on on the telemetry. We're we're meeting groups of people and individuals in the areas that the the eagles are in and then we know where the nest sites are and we uh, meet with the, the landowners and, and build up a relationship with them and then of course there's the follow on uh, monitoring of the of those nest sites to see how successful they are so you can't do it all and 100 percent of it but we certainly try and, and get as much of it as we can and and we have a, a brilliant cohort of, of people who who have a lot more uh, other different types of work to do but a certain percentage of, of this type of work is part of our our brief uh, a question there in relation to, uh, I suppose, uh, a reasonable number coming in, and does that provide enough genetic diversity for a sustainable population? It does. I mean, Norway is a big country. <clears throat> we do it from Flatanger right up in the north, which is up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, we get eagles from there all the way down to Trondheim, which is, you know, a massive area. So, so the DNA uh, uh, profile is very large. And we don't have any difficulty with that. And then that's all part of the management. When those eagle chicks come in, well, then we send uh, birds from Freya to, we'll say, the Killarney uh, release cage one year and, and Hitra another year to Killarney. So, so we mix and match. And we also have to match up the male and female ratio to see, you know, because they're, they're quite, uh, from an early age, to start building relationships um as in after the first year so they're quite comfortable in each other's presence at that stage uh, even though we do have the other aspect of it where we had the um the eagle bee uh that came back from from scotland to us hooked up with a mature male so for the first time and that's going to work if all things go according to plan next year and uh, I suppose one of the there's a question there in terms of the adequacy of of uh food sources given I suppose less less uh, biodiversity out there than it would have been maybe a couple of centuries ago. But is that a, a major concern, or is there enough food out there to sustain the populations? Well, we've had uh, we've had some eagles that we couldn't uh, identify the actual cause of death, um, but the food crop and and the stomach were, were empty in a couple of them. But generally, no, it's not a factor. And and uh, we've watched the eagles now on the nest sites, and when they need to feed the the chick. The eagle chick, it just takes somewhere in the region of two and a half to three minutes from the time the male will leave the area to the time it flies back with, uh, with a pike or a, a bream or a perch or something like that. So the availability of food is not a concern to us out in the countryside for them. Okay, Catherine, loads of questions starting yeah, to come in. Those are very interesting questions. And, and one following on from what you're, what the, about the food there, does the project collect the prey remains from the nest to look at the diet? We do. We collect all that. That's part of the of the research when the lads go up to take the uh, the uh, white tailed eagle chicks from the next for the biometrics and the fitting of the tags. We do a collection. Um, in actual fact, in that nest up in Tipperary, there was a, a head of a pike, and it must have been about well eight or nine pounds. Now you have to realize that the they're big, strong uh, eagles, but there's only a certain weight that they can carry. Um, so it's it, it that was a big pike for that eagle to carry back to the nest. Uh, and is it generally yeah. fish or what other? Generally fish, generally yeah. fish. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what uh, what are the risks to nests with tree felling? Is there a seasonal period, and if the nest is lost, will they build a new nest? Well, it's funny that the, um, they're an amazing the way they go about it, actually. No, sometimes uh, the white-tailed eagles will build two or even three nests. So we'd see where they're building the nest and say that's going to be the nest site for this year. And then we recognize that maybe a kilometer down the, the shore, they're building another nest site. And we say maybe it could be there. And next thing, bang, they'll leave that one and they'll go back to the original one. And that's where they lay the eggs. So we haven't had a problem with uh, tree with, filling. With trees, or okay. Or the, or, the lack, or the lack of trees. Or the lack. I mean, yeah. look, we... And, and trees. just my own question there, is it, is it all usually a Scots pine or can it no, be... No, it could be oak. Scots any pine. tree, okay. Yeah. And um, in Norway, they're quite opportunistic. It can be the side of cliffs or the top of, 
of those telecommunication towers or anything like that. Um, just a few regional ones here. Did the Glen, Glen Gareth pair have chicks this year? Um, and will you continue introducing from Norway or do you have enough from the country now? Sorry, that's a, a more general question. Uh, you probably, no. can you remember with the Glen Gareth pair? Yeah, the Glen Gareth funds, we had, um, we had one chick in Glen Gareth this year. We had four in the, in the Ivory Peninsula. Um, we have uh, one in Loch Derg, one successful nest site, and one in Killarney National Park. So we have seven, seven uh, fled chicks ready to fledge this year, which is very good. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. From that contact, but but we do, yeah. We we the, the nest that we had in Glengarry after we had the camera on that people could hook into and and see the the actual happenings in the nest. That nest failed last year, so it didn't go back to it this year. Mm -hmm. But they they built another nest. That's interesting now for you, John. Yeah. Europe, um, what are place. the prospects for breeding in Mayo or Connacht in general? Will happen. Will happen. We had two attempts up in in Loch Carrob, and further on into Galway. Um, and one successful attack, attempt, so it will happen. It will go up. And we have uh, one of our, our eagle chicks we released last year is up in uh, Connemara in our Mayo National Park um, and another one up in uh, Glenvay. So they, we have eagles going up that neck of the woods, so it will happen in time. Back to the wind turbines. Um, how have the Norwegians dealt with the conflicting issues of needing wind turbines for sustainable energy and the need to protect their eagles? Very difficult one for them, um, and it's one that they they really feel sore about because the the wind turbine is having an impact. Uh, one thing that they do do uh, do that we could actually um, follow their thing. The first um, four meters, the bottom four meters of the turbine are painted black, and the uh, first two meters of the wing tip is also painted black because the birds can't see them. But when they're black and going around, well, then evidently they can recognize there's something there. Um, so that even small little features like that could be a help. But it, it is going to be a factor. We, we are going to have kills and, and we have them with all our, we have them kissed kills, sparrowhawks, the whole lot um, as well. But look, it's, it's a case of having enough out there to sustain those happenings. And I presume the example you gave there was where the wind turbine was right in the wrong place. So I suppose... It would have been, it would have been, yeah, I mean, th there's assessments and everything done from the point of view before the turbines go up. Is it a corridor? Is it a, yeah. uh, you know, a migration route for birds and everything like that? But eagles just go where they want, they please. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you explain the success of the increase in the buzzard population? The buzzard population, well, it's easy to, to explain the success of it, that we have the habitat and we have the food for them. Um, what's most unusual about it is that up to 15 years ago, we didn't have any buzzards in the country really. We had, we had a population in Antrim and a population in Wales. And slowly but surely the Antrim population came south and the Welsh population came west. And all of a sudden we have uh, a large number of um, breeding uh, buzzards in the country, which and, is great for our environment, really. And the habitat that wasn't there before, or is it that they didn't what habitat are we talking about there? The habitat would be just the, the hedgerows and the fields and, and the... Uh, that were always and, there. That's that were the always there, but we just didn't have them. The same as the, um, the, same as the woodpecker. The woodpecker is over here now as well. And um, I suppose in tandem with this white tailed eagle project, we have, we have the red kite and the golden eagle project as well, which is also successful, especially the red kite one. And uh, Lachlan Atul is doing great work up there with the golden eagle one in Donegal and, and Damien Clark in Wicklow with the, the, uh, the uh, kite. So we have all this, we have it all. And uh, in time, it'll you know, prove that birds like the buzzard will come back and use them. Will I keep going, Pat? They're yes, keep going. Thick and fast. And with thanks for your brief answers, because we were allowed to get through. Do you have plans for the introduction of any other keystone species? No, we don't, even though we're, we're a consignatory or a signee of the... Uh, Conservation, the Convention of, of um, Biodiversity. Um, the, <laughs> it takes an awful lot of time and effort and energy and, and resources to do even one reintroduction. And we've done, we've done three now in the last while. So it's not our plan to do it. Somebody else might come along with the idea and, and uh, put it in place. I mean, look, to be great to get beavers back, um, to be that kind of thing. People go mad and start talking about wolves and, and this kind of a thing as well that we once had in the country. But I'd say that's all for another day. No, I don't think you mentioned Donegal. And the question here is: this the same species of eagle that we hear about in Donegal? No, the um, the golden eagle is yeah. from the white-tailed eagle. The white-tailed eagle is the the largest raptor in Europe, 
um, with a 2.4 meter wingspan and the golden eagle is a little less than that and um, so the, the, it's, it's really a more difficult project uh, the white-tailed eagle does it itself the golden eagle has a lot more to contend with okay um, are there management plans been set up for long-term nesting sites no management plan no they pick where they go and uh, we just follow them and see where they go and, and work with that and the question about public reporting public sightings, I think you mentioned that there is a website for that public sighting of the leg bandings. We do. We have it in the npws.ie. We have a tab for white-tailed eagles. You can report it. And the national uh, database as well. And I think the Golden Eagle Trust might have a, a, really, uh, a page as well that they can report them. Um, so there is, uh, and, and it's very helpful to us. That, uh, and we're getting more and more uh, reports and photographs and little videos of uh, white-tailed eagles out in the countryside that we know where they are, but it's great to see them and see that they're healthy. Have any of the white-tailed eagle chicks made it to Donegal, or are they likely to? They have. They've made it. We have uh, two or three up there, and they're quite happy up there. There's one of them up there near Hornhead, actually, right at the tip of it. And Hornhead was one of the areas where we had um and uh, you know a really old nest site so it'd be lovely to see the the white tail leagues going back to the original nest sites and get and, and making up territories there and emma they could live side by side with the golden eagle there'd Absolutely. be no yeah that'd be the natural Eamon, just uh, i suppose one of the things that has come up in a, in a few questions and and it relates to the issue of poisoning and i i presume undoubtedly the practice around poisoning uh, up to recent years was a major factor in, in the loss of, of, of raptors. Uh, what has happened and, and, are, and are there still some concerns? Uh, and I suppose specifically now you, you, you're maybe talking about the, the uh, use of rodenticides and the possibility of that causing problems. What are the issues that, that uh, help to resolve that issue that you had early on? And are there other things that we need to be really careful about in terms of continued use of, of, of poisons and, and rodenticides? Yeah, uh, poisons, uh, well, the, you always have to handle them very carefully anyway. And if you do it the right way, it can bring down the incident so dramatically that it's not an incident at all. Um, the first number of years um, we had we went into a field one day and there was five dead white tail legal chicks <laughs> down below in Kerry. Um, and, and we, you know, we traced it back and we found where it happened and what was used and everything like that. So look, we set up a series of meetings with the, uh, the IFA, the medicines board, the department of agriculture, and we came around to, to, um, to educating people, number one, going door to door, delivering pamphlets in the in the area where it was happening and saying, look, there is another way and, and trying to explain to people. And eventually the message got through and, and look, the laws were strengthened. And then the uh, the the outlets were were examined more, you know, where you could buy the poisons were, were examined a little more in detail and we called around to them. So the whole thing kind of went in its head or, or you know went in a different direction and and here we have now in 2015 was the last poisoning that we had and certainly the first year of release is the critical uh, time for those because they're young uh, eagle chicks that they're out there they, they don't have any parents they're away from Norway they don't have anything to show them really what to do so they would they'll use what they find so but a big one that we have now is uh, lead poisoning um, where lads have to go out and control foxes and there's a way to control them. But what we found in some places is that the foxes are shot and they're left in the field. Uh, the white-tailed eagles will come along and they'll eat the fox and the smallest amount of lead uh, over time will kill a white-tailed eagle. Do you know, when it, it, it ingests it into the system, it, it can't fly, it gets weaker and it just dies. So we've had a couple of those uh, incidences and what we're trying to say to people is, look, go out and do your control. Uh, of the foxes it has to be done make sure you either take the fox and, and get rid of it when you kill it or you bury it in situ or something like that but don't leave it where these birds can can eat it with the lead content in it okay or, or, or i think are there alternatives to to lead in in uh, the use of lead in in shot now as well that's right that's right that's going to become but it's going to be very problematic fact i mean we've forty thousand. Uh, shotguns and licensed firearms in the country or something like that. So it's going to be costly and it's going to be, I don't know, is it going to roll in as easy as what people think? 
Okay, Catherine again? Yeah, um, I suppose the question here about the reintroduction of beavers, but I suppose it, it, it begs the bigger question of where do we stop? Now, I know you said you have no plans, but apart from, from you, um, you know, where do we stop? Or I'm not even sure was the beaver here before, but um, where do you stand on kind of the principles of reintroduction into any country? Well, you see, that's where the, um, the criteria for the uh, biodiversity conventions and all that has to be examined. I mean, you have to go through a whole long checklist. You know, is it, has it been there? Is it possible? Uh, is, it, is there a cost benefit analysis? Um, uh, can you do all the studies that are proved that this is going to merge nice and easily with the, uh, with the environment and what it's supposed to? Uh, but, uh, and can it actually, can, can that species fit back into the niche that it was? Uh, became extinct from. So you have to go through many, many studies. It's not just a case of, we'll bring it in the boot of the car and let it off. Um, and for Charlie Hahi did that down in Inishvikilan with two white-tailed legals in the 80s. And for, you know, it was a lovely initiative to, to see would it work, but it didn't work. You have, to, you have to go through so many processes that it just doesn't happen easy. You have to plan very carefully. And I'm not sure if you're, you know, and I'm not sure, but I don't think the beaver is a, uh, native to where it was ever here do you I know i think it was actually okay okay i think I it, it was and, and you know something from the point of view if you could put a beaver in the right place um well then the flood waters are coming all now at the one time they're flushing into the system when the water uh levels are going down and then you have the problems that places get flooded the beavers build these dams and they stop the water going back and it leaks through you know, so so from that perspective, it could be a help. I'm, I'm not saying it would be, but certainly where you've seen it in uh, the osier beds in Devon and all these places in England where they build um, Sally, uh, Sally hedgerows and all this to, to hold the water, it seeps through it. These are the areas where the beaver is, is there and he's not doing any harm to anything. But uh, again, you, you'd be... A little bit of land, which would be wetland anyway. Um, so maybe... Maybe it could be a consideration. I don't know. But again, you'd have to be assured that any species was here originally. That would be kind of a, a starting point, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, the question, the specific question um, was, do we have sufficient habitat for beavers or do we need to start by funding landowners to leave riparian wooded buffer zones along our farm drains and streams in advance of any reintroduction process? And I suppose I can answer that myself and Pat can answer that from the other angle that we would love that anyway, um, apart from the beaver. But um, I presume more habitat and maybe it's a more general question, Eamon, um, from what linking back to the work that we do. Um, I presume you were, you were happy that we're encouraging more habitat on farm in general of all types. Absolutely. You know, we are, of course, and, and that's happening every day. And um, I suppose to answer, do we have enough wetlands and stuff like that? Look, generally, Ireland is a wet country. And we do have, we have, we have those wetlands. That's why so many drains were widened and rivers deepened over the past 200 years. So we, we would have that kind of a habitat there all the time, but our habitats are, are healthy, even though a study that we've done for the uh, EU and, and our SAC saying that they say that a lot of them are not in the state that they should be. So we have to, we have to be charged with the responsibility now, and we are being charged with the responsibility of trying uh, to get those habitats up to the, the um, standard that they should be as well. And Colin, we have a nice question here that's again relevant to our agricultural advisors and to people listening. Are there an online materials available or opportunities for more awareness campaigns for farmers to show that birds aren't as much of a concern as people think? Absolutely. I mean, they can look, our numbers are on the website and they can ring any one of us at any time. They can ring me any time. And what we can do is assure them of, of, the, uh, of the situation. Or if they have any concerns, we can try and address them. Okay, and I just come back to the shooting. Not supposed to shoot a fox with a shotgun only with a rifle. Somebody made a comment there. Um, I think they've done them both anyway. I, you know, not supposed to. The fox are vermin, you say, so they're not on any shooting list or or open seasons order. Okay, uh, Pat, have you any other one while I look? No, I think, uh, Eamon, you're, you're, you're fairly efficient in, in terms of, of dealing with questions. I think Super. One, one of the uh, the things that I suppose we haven't said that are coming through in the questions are common. positive. Yeah. It's just the, the, the positivity about it. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Kind of comments like, thank you, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and just thanks for a, a wonderful presentation on, on, on this issue. And, and I suppose in the context of, of uh, uh, problems with biodiversity in so many areas, 
it's great to have a good news story uh, uh, as well. It is, Kat, and you know, Kat, sorry, Catherine, uh, we found it very encouraging during the period of COVID that we started the reintroduction phase two, and I think it lifted the country to see that things could happen, uh, that you could get eagle chicks in from Norway during the COVID and, and the second year and, and manage the project. So it was something different as well. So one last one, Pat, there. Do you think, and which are crystal ball, do you think we'll need to introduce more or do you think we... What's your thoughts and hopes? Well, what we're doing is we, we, uh, we've got Fielding to do a modelling for us in 2019. And from his modelling, we were able to see that we needed some more uh, wild tentacle chicks coming in. Um, I, 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 so we're in, in phase two reintroduction. So we'll finish that one and then we'll get him to do another modelling to see are these chicks integrating with the, uh, the, the themselves and the mature ones to make new territories and how that's going? There could possibly be a phase three, but there may not be. And, hope, uh, the hope would be, be the end of it. That you won't. Yeah, the hope would be it'll. That be. would be in in maybe ten years time. Yeah, um, and we'd be following the Scottish model on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I and, and I, I say as uh, thank you very much for for, for that aim and it really really fascinating and and it's I suppose it's just one part of the really important work that's been done out there by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, which I think is is a benefit to to all citizens of Ireland. So th thanks again for your for your work. Thank you, Pat, and thank Catherine and Yvonne yesterday for our help and Andy for asking me to to get involved with this talk series. <laughs> well, you you might find yourself back again. <laughs> okay, just. A, a, a couple of things. Uh, you you thanked Yvonne and, and the ever present Yvonne and Andy uh, as the the uh, uh, production team. The, the the faces on the front here can change a little bit, but but uh, Andy and Yvonne there are, are there the whole time doing doing the hard work in relation to the, this series. So so thanks very much to them. Uh, next week we'll have Tom Houlihan uh, talking about the, the the benefits of incorporating trees in, into the farm on in, in various ways from from, uh, I suppose, copses of trees to individual trees to the incorporation of, of, of forestry. Uh, just a couple of announcements, and, and we talked about the, the I suppose, the, the, a little bit of a release from COVID, and, and we're now beginning to see a number of, of uh, Chagask events and some of the large events happening again. And over the next few weeks, we, we have a, a number of them, and uh, I'll just mention them. And sustainability, uh, uh, farm sustainability will be a key element of the uh, uh, the exhibits in in all of these. The the first one is the sheep open day in in Athenry, which which is on tomorrow. Uh, the second will be the beef open day in in Grange, which is on 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 July the fifth. And there is a, a dairy open day in in uh, Ballyhays on July the thirteenth. So three major farm events, uh, which you're you're all welcome to, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll say thanks to Catherine, thanks to Eamon, and we, hopefully we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Pat. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.